sort of level to aim this at, uh, or what um, what knowledge to assume. So I will just try and give a very general, big picture kind of overview of some of a point of view on gauge theory as mathematicians use it to define invariants of manifolds. And then at the end, I'll explain why this program can't work for Calabi R fourfolds and then how to fix it. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to write on my screen so my head may disappear. I apologize. Um, right, can I share my screen correctly? I'm not currently sharing my screen, right? That's right. You need to share it. So that's okay. And let me hide this. Okay. Is that okay? It's clear. Yeah. Great. Okay. So I, I'm going to start with some um, manifold X uh, with some, let's say, a manifold plus some structure. So that might be a symplectic structure, or it might be a Riemannian manifold, or it might be really later what I'll be concerned with is an algebraic variety, a smooth algebraic variety. And the other data I'm going to have is a vector bundle over X, a topological vector. Okay. Um, and then in this very rough point of view, what I look at is I look at um, some space of connections. So it's traditional to call it curly B. This is some space of connections uh, on F modulo gauge. So I've already divided out by the gauge orbit. So um, the word gauge will never be explained in this talk. Or I've already passed a Coulomb gauge or something like that. Um, but there's some kind of space of connections. You shouldn't worry about what that means. It's infinite dimensional and pretty horrible. And uh, the technicalities can be awful, but we'll get around those in algebraic geometry. And then over that, there'll be some natural infinite dimensional vector bundle, which I'll draw as a one dimensional vector bundle. Okay, so over this, um, I have some B, so this is some infinite dimensional uh, vector bundle, which is just where you can think of it as being trivial. It's just where the gate, the appropriate gauge equation is going to lie. So something like the Hermitian Yang Mills equation, you can think of that as lying in some, um, as some, think of it as some bunch of equations on your connection. Um, if you take each of the components of that equation, there'll be an infinite number of them. So you're taking, it takes values in some R to the infinity or C to the infinity over this B. But really it's more precisely, it's some twisted vector bundle over B. Okay, and then we'll have a section of this vector bundle. And this will be the section, actually, let me call it YM for Yang Mills. This is the section which cuts out um, which connections I'm interested in, which satisfy some nice equation, uh, such as the Yang Mills equations. So let me draw the graph of F. This might look like this. Okay. And then I'll have some locus here where it intersect, where it's zero, and this will be my so-called moduli space. Um, this is moduli space is just a fancy name for parameter space. This parameterizes all solutions of the Yang Mills equations. Um, so this is zeros of my equation, which I'm calling Yang Mills. Um, <clears throat> So, uh, so e.g., Yang Mills might be, um, it might be the something like the field strength of the connection or the um, curvature of the connection, and then maybe maybe some part of the connection of that curvature, which I denote by a plus. So, for instance, um, if my X is a Riemannian four manifold then I might take the anti-self-dual or the self-dual part of the curvature. So that's some sort of half, half of the curvature tensor in some sense. And I would set that to zero over the whole manifold. So that's an infinite number of equations and an infinite number of unknowns. But I draw it with a finite dimensional picture like that. 
Okay. And then um, the situation you want to be in to define invariance is where, um, so to be in the situation of what some people sometimes call Fred Holm topology, this is where um, your infinite number of equations and an infinite number of unknowns, there's two infinities in some sense, cancel out up to finite dimensional up to something finite dimensional. So this is where M is gonna be finite dimensional. So this is where the derivative of my function, Yang-Mills, restricted to the zeros of Yang-Mills, um, should be, so that's some kind of map from uh, T of B, the tangents, tangent bundle of B, to uh, my infinite dimensional bundle E, so these are two infinite rank objects here. This is where this, this map um, is Fred Holm. So this is the situation you want to be in. And in this case, uh, then is dimensional. But I'm not saying that this derivative here is onto. So if it is onto, um, then it'll also be smooth. Smooth if D Yang Mills is subjective by the implicit function theorem. Um, but it may be that uh, D of Yang Mills has some co kernel. In that case, M will have too high a dimension. So. If not, I can send these slides to people if they wish afterwards, of course. I appreciate they're a bit of a mess. Um, if not, so M is, M will have a dimension greater than the problem. So greater than uh, dim B minus rank of E. I'll put this in inverted commas. That, by that, I mean, what do I mean by that? I just mean the Fred Holm index of this uh, derivative of the section. Okay, so this is the general case. So if, if um, in general, you'll find that your equations w won't be transverse. So, um, Imagine you're in a finite dimensional situation and you have uh, a B dimensional space and E equations on it, then you would hope that they would cut out something B minus E dimensional. But because they might not be linearly independent, these equations, you might cut something out, which is B minus E plus a little bit dimensional. So you end up with something that's too big. Okay. But in general, what you would expect, so now want to perturb this function a little bit uh, to make it transverse. Okay, so M has correct dimension. So that's one thing you want to do. And the other thing you want to do is that M in general won't be compact but you would like things to be compact. So also want to compactify M in a natural way. That's all by not adding much extra information. And um, in physics, this corresponds to the fact that the nonlinearities of the equation often make M something close to being compact. This is something to do with some finite energy condition or some L2 norms of um, the curvature being bounded or something like this. Um, and so what happens is you, you have to allow, allow some slightly singular connections or some slightly singular configurations. But if you do that, you get a natural compactification. And the, the final thing you wanna do is you wanna do these two operations simultaneously so that one doesn't muck up the other. So you want the transversality to extend to the compactification. And if you can do this, 
So if can um, then you get a natural invariance of X, the original manifold, uh, by integrating uh, natural cohomology classes. Excuse me. Over this moduli space or uh, the zeros of Young Mills. So, this space of solutions of these Young Mills type equations. Um, and so this can be interpreted, it was interpreted by Witten and maybe a tier in terms of something called topological quantum field theory. Uh, so you localize a path integral over the space of all connections, which is some kind of quantum field theory, uh, to the zeros of this um, section of, uh, so the zeros of the, uh, or the critical points of the action functional. So these are the, my, my Young Mills equations would be the classical. Um, equations of motion or critical points of some Lagrangian. Okay, so um, so the idea is so what you should think of this as being like if you've never seen anything like this before, you should think of um, doing the linear version of this. So the linear version of this will be studying something like um, electromagnetism on X or Hodge theory or Maxwell's equations. Um, and so the solutions would then be vector spaces, so not compact, of course, um, but their dimensions would be topological invariants of X. They would be the Betty numbers of X. And this is a nonlinear version where they, you know, usually the physics gives us nice equations. So the nonlinear nonlinearities feed back in a nice positive way so that my moduli space is close to being compact. And then because it's compact, I can integrate things over it. So um, the easiest thing, so e.g., if that um, dimension, if the virtual dimension, so this was that Fredholm index I mentioned before, so if the, if the expected or correct dimension of M, if the virtual dimension of M is zero, then the invariant is just count the number of points in this moduli space, so count solutions of this young Mills equation. Okay, so that's the big picture sort of overview of Don of what people call Donaldson-like invariants uh, in geometry. So are there any questions about that before I move on? Okay, next page. So now, from now on, I'm going to work in algebraic geometry. So X is going to be a smooth algebraic variety of the complex numbers. And I'm going to want to try and exploit algebraic geometry to actually define things which are more calculable, which you can really calculate with. So I'm going to want to go to finite dimensions. And the, the, the thing underpinning this, why this has anything to do with gauge theory or what I was talking about, is this donaldson ullenbeck yao theorem um, from the mid 80s, which says that in this case, uh, solutions of the Yang Mills equations, at least under certain conditions, so I'll call them the Hermitian Yang Mills equations. This is a slight um, variant or restriction, um, are equivalent to, so that solutions of a partial differential equation are equivalent to objects in algebraic geometry. So stable holomorphic. Uh, structures on that fixed bundle F that I started with, that fixed topological bundle, I can put lots of different holomorphic structures on it. I can see it as an algebraic bundle in many different ways, but the stable ones, which are the generic ones, um, are all emit unique solutions of the Hermitian equations. Topological 
uh, and then uh, um, reducibles and automorphisms and so on. So I'll just put ish there. Uh, but more or less, that's correct. Okay, so you don't need to know what this is, what, but what it means is that um, the gauge equation can be solved in terms of purely algebraic data. Okay, so this is, this is, these are objects of pure algebraic geometry. And in algebraic geometry, we have, we can form a nice moduli space of these stable holomorphic bundles. It's also an algebraic variety and it also has a natural compactification. So there exists sort of separately from gauge theory, there exists a nice projective um, compactification um, of uh, the space of stable holomorphic vector models. Again, in al this is an algebraic object. So it's, um, and we compactify by certain singular holomorphic bundles called uh, coherent sheaves. And you don't need to know what that means for this talk. But this, this is a nice object of algebraic geometry. Um, so we would like to do all the other things I said, the perturbation. Uh, so I've told you the compactification. We would like to do the perturbation as well within algebraic geometry. Okay. So the problem is um, in algebraic geometry, there do not in general exist uh, enough perturbations. Okay, so if you're dealing with PDE and, you know, smooth functions, then there's infinitely many, um, what do you call them, uh, deformations. And if you're dealing with polynomials, there's many fewer. So the, um, algebraic geometry is much more rigid. Um, and also, so that's one problem. So that's one. And two, even if there were, um, we want to stay in finite dimensions to do our algebraic geometry. So we don't want to sit this, consider this m bar as being the zeros of some infinite number of equations in an infinite dimensional space, because then we'll lose the interpretation in algebraic geometry. Um, so, so the the um, the infinite dimensional uh, picture from my a few from the start of the talk so the, is is not available to us i mean it is but if we insist on just doing algebra geometry then it's not available to us to just doing algebra geometry because i want to produce a theory that's entirely calculable it doesn't use anything infinite dimensional Okay, so this is not available to us. However, it's um, infinitesimal or tangent version. It's an infinitesimal version. It's so. What do I mean by that? What I mean is this sort of complex. Well, there's an exact sequence. So uh, let's think. I used this bit before. So if I take the tangent space to the space of connections to the zeros, which was this M or M bar, and then I take the derivative of my section to my infinite dimensional bundle restricted to M bar, and I consider this uh, map here. What's the kernel? Well, the kernel, of course, is all the directions in TB along which Yang Mills doesn't change, so that's TM. And then the co-kernel, um, that's the thing that the uh, equations, the linear parts of the equations don't reach. So that's the thing in the um, implicit function theorem. That's the co -kernel, that's the, what we call the obstruction space. Okay, so I'll just call this ob. Anyway, that's, the, that's where all bad, 
that's where all badness resides. When the, when the co-kernel vanishes, then this M bar is nice and smooth of the correct dimension. In general, all the non-linearities and singularities are all encoded in equations in OB. Uh, this so-called obstruction space. Okay, this bit, this is visible uh, to algebraic geometry, surprisingly. So even though these two pieces here in the middle are infinite dimensional, up to something called quasi-isomorphism, I, ca I can remove an infinite dimensional part from each in such a way that it doesn't change this exact sequence. And because it, the kernel and the co-kernel are both finite dimensional objects, so I can replace this infinite dimensional so-called resolution of them by something finite dimensional, and that thing is, is visible to algebraic geometry. So uh, what what we're discussing here roughly speaking is the is the deformation theory of m so when you have a solution you can look to first order can i deform the solution is it still an equation a solution of the equations and so on i can work to higher and higher order that's called deformation theory and what i'm saying is that the deformation theory of solutions of the young mills equations there's also a donaldson and lumet theorem for that so the deformation theory can also be seen in terms of deformation theory of coherent sheets. So in terms of deformation theory and algebraic geometry. So the two, the PDE side and the algebraic geometry match up perfectly under this donaldson lumbeck yao theorem. So um, how do I want to say that? So uh, let me grab this. I'm not sure how. Actually, I'll regret doing that. Let's see if I can copy and paste it. I should have practiced this, shouldn't I? I'm having to use my keyboard to do it. Let's see. No, it doesn't like that. Okay, I'll draw it. I shall draw it again. Anyway, very briefly. What I can do is I can find, I'm not going to match with any parts of this Young-Mills functional, but because this uh, derivative of Young-Mills here is Fredholm, what that means is it's an isomorphism up to some finite dimensional pieces. So I can pick an infinite dimensional piece, which sort of absorbs all the, who's, who's, no, it doesn't absorb all the interesting things. It's orthogonal to all the interesting things. So um, I can pick some kind of E primed here, E primed here. So I can pick some sub bundle here on which this is an isomorphism. This D of Yang Mills is an isomorphism on this sub bundle here and this sub bundle here. It matches them up perfectly. And the co kernel is finite dimensional. So I'm going to call this E0. Yes, E1. And what that means is, so I'm not describing this perfectly well, but uh, these are now finite dimensional. And this complex, um, we can see this complex. Uh, arises in algebraic geometry in the deformation theory or deformation and obstruction theory of um, any given uh, stable coherent sheaf or stable vector bundle uh, F with a holomorphic structure in my moduli space. So if you're an algebraic geometer, then I guess you already know this. This is this is the thing. Uh, this is the complex R harm uh, F F up to some shift or maybe trace free. Uh, it's the thing which computes whose core mol it's a it's a complex of sheaves over the moduli space, but it's the thing which computes um, its zeroth core well depends on your indexing notation. It's zeroth cohomology 
is x1 f f. This is the tangent space to the moduli space at f. And it's first cohomology x2 f f. This is the obstruction space. Okay, that, that was uh, not helpful. But uh, this bit is entirely seen within algebraic geometry. Okay, so um, even though I don't see the infinite dimensional picture, I see kind of up, up to removing finite infinite dimensional pieces which don't do anything. So these E primes here. So up to sort of removing an infinite number of linearly dependent R transverse. What I'm left with is a finite number of equations uh, which cut me out of a finite dimensional space. Um, and I don't quite have that, but I have it along the moduli space. So, you know, this, this, cut, this choosing these E primes here, choosing uh, an infinite number of the equations which are transverse and linearly independent, and sort of cutting down by those first to remove to cut down to a smooth finite dimensional space on which I then impose the final equations lying in E1, um, which are nonlinear. I can't actually do that globally over the moduli space, but I can do it locally and I can do it infinitesimally. So I can, I can get, I can't get that, um, I can't convert that infinite dimensional picture into a finite dimensional picture within algebraic geometry but I can sort of convert its tangent space into a finite dimensional picture and uh, the derivative of its equations into a finite dimensional picture. All that I can do with an algebra geometry. Okay, so um, roughly speaking, so the upshot is the following. Here's the situation. So the upshot is that um, this M bar, we can see let me see. So let's say would like, here's the fantasy, would like to see M bar cut out of a smooth finite dimensional algebraic variety Uh, by a section of a finite uh, dimensional vector bundle over. So that's what we'd like. So we'd like a finite dimensional version of the picture that I had before. So I would have something like this section and sat in here, I have the zeros of that section and that would be my moduli space. Okay, and everything would be algebraic. Okay, so we would like that. Um, we don't have this, but we do have its infinitesimal version, so it's derivative near M, and we can have it locally. One can prove that you can do all this locally, but locally over M bar, we have, it. We have the descriptions like this. And globally, we have its derivative for its infinitesimal version. Okay, so we have this, the data that you get by differentiating it. So you have this, this complex here. Um, so what we've done here is we've tried to cut down the infinite dimensional picture to a finite dimensional picture. You can't necessarily do that. 
But when we take the derivative, we can do that. And that was what I was doing way back here where I was cutting out these E primes here. I'm not sure how well I explain that, but it's not too important. Next page. It'll turn out that this is enough to do what we want to do. Okay, so here's what we want to do. So we want to, remember we've got this problem that the moduli space in general will be of too high a dimension. And the reason is this obstruction space or this co-kernel of the derivative of the section will be non-zero. So we want to somehow get around this. And if we had a picture like this, this fantasy picture here, then what we would like to do is perturb S so that it becomes transverse. But because we're in, firstly, we don't have this picture, we only have its infinitesimal version. And secondly, in algebraic geometry, we don't have perturbations generally. So what are we going to do? So this is the next section. So this is called localized Euler classes. So what we're going to do is the following. First, let's pretend the fantasy picture holds. So let me call this fantasy picture something. Star. So what um, we suppose that star holds globally. So we really have some nice finite dimensional model for our moduli space and we see it cut out of some smooth ambient space. Then M should be the Euler class or Poincaré dual to it of E over B. Okay, because it's the zeros of a section. That's what the Euler class is. Um, and it isn't quite because the section isn't transverse. So if we could perturb the section, then it would be. But um, even if we could perturb even if we could perturb S, um, this wouldn't be good because that would move Uh, the z in general, the zeros of s, so our replacement for m, out of m. So I would end up, if I did perturb s, the zeros of s would, would move, and instead of just being m, they would be nearby. And that's not good, because now they would lie in this b, which is some artificial construct, um, and we don't want them to lie in b. We want them to really lie on m. Okay, so what we, um, so instead, Uh, we use Fulton McPherson intersection theory to get an answer on M without perturbing the section. So in situ. So what do they do? They replace the graph of my section inside E they make it more and more vertical. So what they do is they replace it by the graph of t times s, where t is some large number, and then they take the limit as t tends to infinity. And this is something called a cone inside E. So the picture is the following. Here's your b. Here's your e over b. Here's my graph of s. Here's my moduli space. Now what we do is we make S more and more vertical. So this is the graph of T times S. And this was the graph of S here. And then we take the limit as S goes to, uh, as S goes to infinity. And this graph gets more and more vertical. And in the limit, it becomes something sort of more linear. So this is this cone C. 
it becomes invariant under dilation. That becomes a cone. You can scale it by the real numbers or the complex numbers in my case. Okay. And the beauty of this cone is, the advantage of this cone is it's entirely supported over M. It's no longer, I no longer see the rest of B. It only sees M. And so we can now replace, so what you find is that the intersection of the graph of S with E is the same as the intersection of the cone in a topological sense, this is, or an algebraic geometry uh, sense, with the, the zero section of E restricted to M. Okay, so this was my Euler class of E, and this is my localized Euler class, which depended on the section and it's entirely supported on the zeros of the section. And so, um, if, if the fantasy holds, so suppose star holds, so suppose we have this global uh, picture, then we can, um, instead of perturbing S, what we can do is we can deform S to this cone and then we can work just on M. And now we can do our perturbations or we can intersect in any way you like. There are lots of ways of doing this in our geometry and topology. And we can get, uh, but we can do something now entirely on M without moving off M and we can define the correct moduli space that we can then integrate over, or if it's zero dimensional, we can count the number of points and this will define our invariant. Okay. Um, we don't have that fantasy, but we do have, remember, so even when a star does not hold. only its infinitesimal version or its derivative uh, we can define this C so even though I don't have the global B, I only have its sort of tangent directions along M. I can only see, I can only see B sort of infinitesimally around M and I can only see E on M. So the data C inside E over M, this data, which is enough to define our so-called local, localized Euler class, this data um, does exist. Um, exists globally. So yeah, I, I just say without writing anything down, what what's going on there is that um, locally we can locally um, around some bundle in M, some point of M, we can cut down that gauge theory picture, that infinite dimensional picture, to a finite dimensional picture. But we can't do that compatibly. We can't do that. We can do that on any open set, but we can't glue that. Um, the results don't glue. There's no reason why you can do that globally. But the infinitesimal version, you can prove you can glue. So that will work. And then that's enough. Because this cone only sees data over M, and it only sees infinitesimal data, then you can prove that this, this cone does glue. So the um, thinking of the cone as the the infinitesimal version of the section or some kind of limit of the section um, that bit all makes sense so you can't you can't find a b globally you can't find an e globally but you can find it infinitesimally close to b and because of this fulton mcpherson cone construction that's enough okay. so that that's fine so now so now can define I can intersect C with the zero section of E 
on the moduli space um, to get the correct M. So even though M is too big, this new intersection, so this is called the virtual cycle. So it's called M the, and it's in the homology of M. So this is so-called virtual cycle. And it's due to Berend, Fantecki, Lee and Tian around 20 years ago. Um, and it's defined purely within algebraic geometry. So you don't need to use homology. You can use the so-called algebraic geometric version of this called um, Chow homology, which is denoted by an A instead of an H. Um, so this thing is defined essentially to be this thing. And um, what it is, is it's, it's the fundamental class of M if you were able to perturb M to be of the correct dimension. Even when you can't perturb M to be of the correct dimension, you still get this cycle of the correct dimension, which is like the fundamental class of M. It's what the fundamental class of M ought to be, and it's what it is if you can perturb everything, and if M, or if you can be in a situation where M has the correct dimension. So it has all nice properties, and it's the right thing to use, and it's defined purely within algebraic geometry. And um, this leads to essentially the modern field of enumerative algebraic geometry. It's a subject which it rigorizes the, you know, the hundred year old field of enumerative algebraic geometry, which um, only worked under very restrictive assumptions. So what we do is the field of al enumerative algebraic geometry counts things in algebraic geometry. So you might count the number of degree D curves through 3D minus one points in the projective plane, or the number of coherent sheaves of a certain type on a Clavier threefold, or this counting is always done by counting the points in this virtual cycle or by integrating cohomology classes over this virtual cycle. Um, okay, so what does this have to do with sheets and so forth? So, um, so e.g., uh, we can count stable coherent sheets or singular vector bundles on Calabi now three folds. Now, um, what's this talk meant to be about? Just the last 10 minutes about Calabi out four folds. Here it doesn't work. And the reason is that in this case, the setup is not Fred Holm. If you look at this from a gauge theory point of view, this is not this does not fall into the set and um, the, the framework that I've been describing. Okay. So in this case, what the gauge theory gives you is that um, the bundle E, the bundle E that cuts that we um, cut out our moduli space with, but with a section off, this bundle E, either in infinite dimensions in the gauge theory setup, or in finite dimensions in the local algebra geometric setup or the infinitesimal algebra geometric setup. This bundle E, um, in this case, naturally has a quadratic form and a, an orientation. It's naturally um, is an um, SO uh, 2NC bundle, let's say. In the gauge theory setup, N there is infinite, so it's some kind of infinite vector bundle, but with a quadratic form. And the, that's fine. And the section, which I've been calling YM, is not an arbitrary section, so you can't really perturb it. It's got a special property. It respects this, S, this quadratic form, this geometry that is isotropic. So um, Q of the section with itself is zero, where Q is the quadratic form. Okay, so the, the picture changes now. 
you have that there's this moduli space, which is the zeros of the section inside some ambient bundle. So you want to kind of think of this globally as a picture, but then not globally, or infinitesimally as an Amber geometric picture. Uh, so this is the setup now. And um, what you find is that, roughly speaking, the rank of E should be thought of as being twice the rank of B, the dimension of B. So this can't be a Fred Holm situation. So it's two times infinity minus infinity is not a finite number. And um, what, uh, there's, a, there's a fix for this in gauge theory. So I'm going to lie a little. I've been lying quite a lot, but I'm going to lie a little bit more now. So um, due to Borisov and Joyce, what they do is they replace E by its real form. So under the um, homotopy equivalence between SO2NC and SO2NR, what you find is that any complex quadratic bundle, any quadratic form, is the, has an underlying real bundle of which it's just the complexification. So you write, so your E with a Q here, with its quadratic form, is just a certain real bundle plus I times a real bundle. So it's just a certain real bundle tensor with the complex numbers. Where on here, Q is a real positive definite. And then by, since I squared is minus one here, Q will be um, real and negative definite. And uh, on cross terms, it'll be complex. And then they project the section Yang-Mills to one component uh, to get something Fred Holm. So now, because you've cut the dimension down by a half, it, it really does become Fred Holm. And what you find is, so you, you sort of write YM is YM plus, YM minus, with respect to the splitting of the bundle into two pieces. And the um, isotropic condition so, um, tells you that uh, so let me denote the quadratic form on the real bundle just as a norm, because that's what a real quadratic form is. So it tells you that this is this. That's what the, the isotropic condition says, which is a half of this. Um, so what this tells you is that whenever the, the Young-Mills section or the Young-Mills equations vanish, um, then actually this component also vanishes, that's obvious, but the, the reverse implication is very powerful. So it says if, if a half of the equations vanish, then all of the equations vanish because of this condition here. Okay, so this isotropic condition says you can, you can consider just half the equations and then all the equations will vanish. So this restores Fred Holmality to the problem uh, and using this, they're able to define invariants using gauge theory-ish. That's not really what they do, but that's how you can interpret what they do. Okay, so, um, but what they get is that, so, um, so they get a virtual cycle. And the, usual, the actual method they use is um, something called real derived differential geometry. And so the, the class they get is not algebra geometric and it's not really calculable. So they get an m ver in um, the homology of m, which is good, that's what we want, um, but it's not calculable. That can't, 
calculate it. Sorry, my handwriting's falling apart. Can't calculate with it. And just very briefly to finish, what our work is that there's an algebra geometric version. And um, what it uses is instead of this splitting, so whenever you have a vector space with a quadratic form over the complex numbers, you can try and split it, you can try and see it, you can do it like that. You can pick an orthonormal basis and take its real span, and you'll get a nice real positive definite subspace in this way. And then you can use multiply by i, and you'll get this negative definite subspace, and that'll give you a splitting of your bundle. That's one thing you can do. The other geometry that you get once you have a complex bundle with a quadratic form is you can use a different kind of splitting. So we use instead um, complex isotropic. Uh, sub bundles of e. Okay, so um, and maximal as well. So we say, uh, so there'll be a definition. So <coughs> I'm, I guess I'm doing this definition in finite dimensions now. So suppose I'm on some algebraic variety and I have a Holomorphic vector bundle with a quadratic form, then a subbundle lambda is called isotropic. If Q restricted to lambda is identically zero. Okay. So and then and it's called maximal isotropic if the rank of lambda is a half. The rank of e. So that's the biggest possible dimension it can be. So uh, let me just give you a trivial example. So, e.g., on C2 with the quadratic form Z1 squared plus Z2 squared, then the maximal isotropics are um, the span of this vector 1i is a maximal isotropic. And so is the span of one minus i. Okay. And we have time. Uh, how will I say this? So, um, so as before. In algebraic geometry, uh, the deformation theory of sheaves on your Calabrian fourfold uh, gives you um, the data of. Um, so this, so not quite the data of an ambient space with equations cutting it out, but the infinitesimal version of that. So a cone in a bundle over uh, the moduli space. Up to some nonsense that I won't go into. And the, in the um, Calabi R fourfold case, it would be wrong to intersect this cone with the zeros of E. And I, I won't quite go into why that is, but what would be right, the right thing to do, so then um, the right thing to do is to either one, um, 
split E as uh, ER plus IER and now intersect C with the zeros of ER, even though C doesn't quite lie in there and this is hard to do and there's, there's some work to do here. Um, but this is roughly what Borisov and Joyce do. And this is not an algebra geometric thing to do. But two, what, what you could do is you could try to find, try to find a maximal isotropic lambda in A and intersect that with C. And so um, what we do is prove that one um, Even though, uh, so one lambda need not exist, but it's enough to work on a certain cover uh, where it does exist. Um, so this is a bit like the splitting principle in topology that if you pass to a bigger space, you can pull up, you can work up there and you can assume your bundle is splits into line bundles or, or whatever, whatever you want it to do. It can behave better. And then you can study whether you can descend back to the space you started on. So that's what we do. We show that you can pass to a certain cover on which Lambda tautologically exists. There's always a maximal positive uh, isotropic sub bundle. And we can use that and then prove afterwards that whatever we do with that, we can descend back to the moduli space. So that's the first thing we do. So uh, you should think of this as saying lambda might not exist, but locally lambda exists, and we average over the space of all lambdas, and then we can descend back to where we started. Uh, so that's one thing we do. And then two. Um, we find a way, so this is a bit technical, so this is called co-section localization in algebraic geometry. Uh, to intersect lambda with this cone in such a way that the answer Uh, lies in the zero section of E, which is the original moduli space. Uh, so that's not obvious. So uh, I'm probably, I'm quite sure I've lost you by now, but the, um, what I'm saying here is that the analog of this need not hold in our setting. So whereas Borisov and Joyce split the bundle and then project the section and show that basically doesn't lose much information, here that doesn't work. Passing to this maximal isotropic loses a lot of information. And what, where that messes up is that the intersection, what, what I'm roughly doing is picking half the equations. And what I'm saying here is that when you do that, you have too much information. But then we can use the half that we've thrown away to do something called cosection localization, which is roughly speaking a perturbation of our equations. So that suddenly our, the zeros of our equations come back to being the zeros of the original equations. So the, um, there's, a, there's a way around the problems that our method introduces, okay? So th the upshot is, um, if you wanna think about what's going on here, you should think about it, about it gauge theoretically, and you should uh, follow the Borisov choice approach. So. Borisov Joyce approach makes perfect sense. Um, it's the right way of looking at things. It's the analog, it's the complex analog on Calabi R fourfolds of what Donaldson does on real four manifolds, where he considers only the self dual part of the Yang Mills equations. So the, the, the part that um, Borisov and Joyce consider in this real sub bundle here.
correspond to, in some sense, the complex self-dual part of the Yang Mills equations. And they show that that gives you a perfectly nice theory in gauge theory invariance. And the upshot of what we do is that by instead of choosing some real half of the equations, we choose some algebraic holomorphic half of the equations, we can get an algebra geometric version of their virtual cycle. And um, the discussion down here where I got a bit confusing is just saying that when you do that, you lose some nice properties. Everything goes wrong. Suddenly the half of the equations that you're taking are not equivalent to the original equations. You've lost too much information. But I'm saying that there's some jiggery pokery we can do in algebraic geometry to get around that using these are the, the words for how we get around that. Um, that gives us a way of defining this virtual cycle in algebraic geometry. And so the upshot is there exists a virtual cycle in algebraic geometry Uh, which maps, so not quite in here, we have, to, we have to invert two in our coefficients because of these covers that we take, uh, such that it's class, when I pass to ordinary homology, and this maps to the Borisov Joyce. Um, okay, and because it's defined in algebraic geometry, and uh, so let me just say with nice properties. And then there, so there exists, for instance, a, tor a torus localization formula. So if your space has some symmetries, you can localize this virtual cycle to the fixed points of that symmetries. And this means you can really calculate. Okay, so I finished that. Okay, good. great. Thanks very much for that wonderful talk. Let me stop.